If you uh, were planning to present a poster, I hope you have everything ready. And tomorrow afternoon, we'll set up the posters um, upstairs on the terrace level. So, um, okay. Okay, so we can start now with the first lecture. Um, on the introduction to tensor networks. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, is that better? Okay. Hi, my name is Miles, and I'll be telling you about um, tensor networks today. I'll be introducing them like pedagogically, and then I'll end today the second lecture by also introducing machine learning. And then tomorrow, I'll tell you about using tensor networks to do machine learning. So actually kind of exporting ideas from physics outside of physics to other subjects. But then we'll bring it full circle at the end and um, apply tensor networks to machine learning on quantum computers, at least mostly theoretically. But I'll show you one experiment that another group did where they actually did this in, um, in real life, like on an actual um, quantum hardware. So we'll try to bring it full circle at the end. So who's heard of tensor networks before? Okay, oh, that's great. Who's actually done like a calculation involving them before? All right, some of you have? Okay, it's a good number. Awesome, okay, who works on machine learning in some form or has used it a little bit or interested in it? Okay, great. All right, so there's a lot of uh, people here who have some background already, but many of you don't, so I'll try to um, go slowly enough and uh, please stop me at different times if, if something is, you wanna understand something a little better or make me slow down, okay. Um, so let me just quickly introduce myself. So I'm a, currently a research scientist at this new place called the Flatiron Institute, and I'll tell you a bit more about that. Uh, my specialty is um, developing software and algorithms to, mod, uh, to model you know, the mini electron problem, mini uh, body problem. Um, so one thing I'm working on right now is a follow-up on some work I did last year on using DMRG tensor network methods to do quantum chemistry. So this is partly just to say, you know, these are very broad methods. I'll have more to say about that. You can apply them to lots of things. But I've also been working the last few years on applying them to do machine learning. Um, and I'll tell you a lot more about that. Um, so what is the Flatiron Institute? So this is a new place I thought it would be worth spending a couple slides to tell you about. So this is a um, kind of a philanthropic institute, not maybe so different from, from ICTP, although the funding is, is all privately coming from this one uh, private foundation, the Simons Foundation. And um, it's in New York City. And basically, the mission of it is to advance scientific research by advancing computational methods, right? So in a lot of areas of science, the focus is some topic like, we're going to do chemistry, or we're going to do materials uh, science or something, and then we might use computers. Here, it's like we're focused on advancing computer methods directly. Um, and, and in some centers, this involves a lot of data analysis. In our center, it's more about modeling and simulation. And one key aspect of our center is that, or, or all these centers, is that we're developing and, and advancing open source software and then releasing it to all of you and supporting it. Um, and so the four centers now that, that occupy this building are um, the one for computational astrophysics, Center for Computational Biology. Um, I'm in the CCQ, the Center for Computational Quantum Physics. And then um, the newest one that's gonna be coming online this fall is gonna be the Center for Computational Mathematics. So that one will be kind of involved in all the other three, develop, you know, developing um, applied mathematics techniques, things like uh, packages for solving partial differential equations or uh, methods like that, for example. Okay, and then I decided to show a cool picture of New York City and where we are. So sometimes people ask, are we in the Flatiron Building? No, so that's the Flatiron Building. You see that little triangular-shaped building? Uh, this is Fifth Avenue running, there's Central Park, and it runs you know, all the way down. And uh, we're in this building over here. And the Simons Foundation is right across the street. So I thought I would flash that up to say, please come visit us sometime, and, and you can check out New York City and talk to a bunch of physicists. So, um, so it's a really fun place to work. OK, so uh, let me know if you have any more questions about that later. So I thought I would start my introduction to tensor networks very broadly with the kind of classic application of tensor networks, which is one you're all interested in, which is the quantum minibody problem. All right, so some of, this, some of these slides are some kind of old chestnuts of things that you've seen before, but I thought I would still uh, mention them, right? So what is the quantum minibody problem very broadly? Well, it's a very tough problem, and it's a problem of solving the behavior of electrons in matter. So what makes it so tough, right? It's a continuum problem, right? You have you know, electrons moving in a 3D continuum. Um, well, it's 3D, that's really tough. 
and it involves strong and important interactions between electrons. Not, they're not always so important, but in many cases they are, and, and we'd like to deal with them to be precise about the problem. Okay, and the interesting thing philosophically is that this is a problem where we know our theory of everything, right? We know what we have to do. So this isn't exactly the theory of everything. I mean, here I'm, I'm not including maybe all the effects that are important, but, but for many problems it's sufficient just to solve the, the properties of the um, eigenstates of, of this Hamiltonian. So this is the Hamiltonian where you just have, um, that should say dr, but this is where you have, you know, standard kinetic energy term and some kind of background potential, and then you have the electron-electron interactions, and here the background potential is just coming from static nuclei. So you just have nuclei um, with uh, z protons, and then you have, you know, those, the electrons feel those uh, nuclei, and then they also repel from each other. So if you could solve that, you could, you could do a lot of physics and chemistry very, very precisely. So we know what to do, um, but the problem is we don't have really good ways to do it necessarily. So this is this famous quote by Dirac where basically he says, we know what to do, and like in a nutshell he's saying basically we know what to do to do a large part of physics in the whole of chemistry. That might be an exaggeration about the whole of chemistry part, but he says that the, um, the equations are much too complicated to be solvable, so it becomes desirable that approximate practical methods um, should be developed. Um, and we want to describe the main features without too much computation. So that's what's really important, right? So we want to have some kind of way of getting at the most important parts without spending too much computational time. And so tensor networks, which I'll be telling you about, are one of the many different approaches to try to cut through these two issues. Um, so how do you start, you know, how do you start reducing the complexity of this problem? There's lots of different things that you do. Um, one thing you do is you might take the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, say uh, treat the nuclei as, as just uh, classical objects. Um, another thing is, you know, project, this is very common, is to project the electronic motion into certain orbitals. You don't always do this, but most, most methods do. Um, that means you just say, okay, we're going to chop up the continuum in a certain way based on electronic orbitals. And you can even go as far as to um, throw the wave function out entirely and say, let's not even involve that. Let's use things like density functional theory and the local density approximation. Um, and you can reduce things down to model systems. That's another thing you can do. And try to get the dimensionality of the problem down. Um, so this is just a cartoon drawing of, say, like the 1D Hubbard model and what its Hilbert space looks like, where you have electrons with spin, and some sites could be filled, and some could be empty. But you're still, at the end, after all these kind of things, you're still stuck with the problem that the Hilbert space still grows exponentially with the number of electrons. So it's still a really tough problem. Um, so how can we go about this problem? I mean, so like I mentioned, one thing you can do is you can try to throw the wave function away. You can try to use Monte Carlo to sample, sample over electronic configurations. Um, but you can also think about maybe we could work with wave functions. You know, maybe we could actually, um, can actually reckon with them somehow, okay? Um, so let's start thinking about the wave function. So what is the wave function? It's an assignment of an amplitude to every classical state that the electrons can move through. So what are those classical states, right? Let's say we had some kind of partially filled system and we have electrons that can be up or down and they can be on different sites. So really every site can have four states. It could be empty, up, down, or doubly occupied. So we'd have four to the n states given in sites that we could have, if, if I'm thinking kind of in a grand canonical ensemble sense here. Um, so we could try to actually naively store this wave function, but as you know, that wouldn't work. And why is that? It's just because four to the n is, is extremely rapid growth. Right, so if n is 10, 4 to the 10, that's 10 to the 6. That's already getting to, you know, be painful for classical computers. If n is 20, like 20 sites holding electrons, 4 to the 20, that's 10 to the 12, 30, 10 to the 18. Once you get to about 130 sites and you try to describe that full Hilbert space, then that's a number of amplitudes that's actually greater than the number of atoms in the entire known universe. So if you just said each atom could kind of carry off one of these probabilities and we could sort of somehow use the whole universe as a big memory, um, then you could do maybe 130 sites, but you do 131 and you'd need two universes, right? And, or, you know, four more universes or something. You do 132, you would need, you know, 16 more universes. So it would start getting really problematic, right? So that's not going to work, just to store all the amplitudes. Maybe we can do 10 sites, 20 sites, 50 sites, but forget about 130 ever, right? Okay, but can nature even really be doing this? Like, so we think, we say that's what the wave function is, but is that even really right? I mean, is that, you know, Walter Cohn, I think, I'm not gonna, I don't remember the exact quote, but he, he tended to even think that the idea of a wave function was kind of a fictitious idea almost, right? Could this really be right? Could, could this really be what nature is doing if it takes that much memory even to store the wave function? 
Um, are the amplitudes of a realistic wave function all completely independent numbers that you really have to store separately? Or is there some kind of simplifying structure going on that makes this really, uh, makes the wave function like a feasible concept to work with and think about? Um, so it turns out there is, right? So otherwise I wouldn't be saying that. Um, so the, this, there's been major progress in the last 30 years understanding that there is structure in quantum wave functions and what that structure is and how we could exploit it. And there's different approaches, but the one I'll be talking about is a certain line of thinking involving quantum entanglement. And um, so when you think about quantum entanglement between particles, it means that the particles aren't all just doing their own thing, but there's some kind of correlations, and you can like, take advantage of these correlations. And um, when you do this, you are naturally led to the idea of tensor networks. I'll, I'll have more to say about what these diagrams mean and what these different tensor networks are. But basically, you can think about entanglement patterns in some kind of natural quantum wave function, not just an arbitrary quantum wave function, imparting or stamping some kind of internal structure to the wave function. Or, or the other way around is to say that you can impose some internal structure that limits what correlations this wave function can actually have, but it could limit it to the right subspace where natural wave functions are actually can be found and manipulated. Okay. And so the payoff of doing this, of working with tensor networks, is you get a set of numerical methods that you can apply to strongly correlated systems. So that's really interesting. Um, it's not just like starting from a weakly correlated system, like thinking of it as maybe a Slater determinant and then tacking on a few more. It's actually almost starting at the other end. In fact, these methods actually work better for strongly correlated systems typically than they do for weakly correlated systems. So it's kind of complementary in that sense. But they actually work for both weakly and strongly correlated systems. Um, so that's really nice. Their main, their main Achilles heel right now is dimensionality. So they're really good, as, as many of you know, at 1D systems, 2D systems. This can include 3D physics, like it could be a 1D chain of 3D atoms. But, but in terms of what their weakness is, is that if you take a infinite 1D system, fine. An infinite 2D system, okay. Infinite 3D system right now is not in the works. But it's, it's or, sorry, I shouldn't say in the works. It's not happening, but it is in the works. Maybe years from now we'll be doing that. Um, uh, but other, it has other benefits too, not just numerical methods, but using tensor networks is a really nice uh, framework for how to think about wave functions. And it's been used very fruitfully to understand exotic quantum states, things like spin liquids, fractional quantum Hall effect states, et cetera. And um, as I'll be motivating throughout the, the talks today and tomorrow, in fact, it really could be thought of as a very general approach to applied math problems involving really big tensors. So there's a community of mathematicians that include physicists who are interested in studying and decomposing tensors, but, but some of the mathematicians have been focused on cases involving tensors with three indices or four indices. So some of them think about, you know, okay, you have a vector, a matrix, and then a tensor is one or two steps past that. But in physics, we've actually been now for 30 years thinking about tensors with something like hundreds or thousands of indices or even an infinite number of indices, and we have this whole machinery. And that could be very interesting in applied mathematics. And by applied mathematics, I'm including machine learning. So that's some direction I think is interesting to go. Um, so I'm trying to get more people interested in this topic even outside of physics. Okay, so the outline of where I'm gonna go is, today I'm gonna do some more introduction of tensor networks and mainly motivate them through the lens of matrix product states and kind of give you a pedagogical introduction to those. Um, and then, um, later today, I'll tell you about some basics of doing computations as matrix product states and give you some resources, and then um, end up today by introducing machine learning, and um, actually, I'm going to kick that a bit to tomorrow. So tomorrow, I'll talk about using tensor networks for machine learning and quantum computing with tensor networks, and um, show you some different things you can do combining these ideas together. All right. So um, to motivate tensor networks in matrix product states, let's think of like the simplest lattice model that we can, and then try to kind of think about how could we tackle and understand the wave function of, of this kind of lattice model. So the simplest one I can think of is the transverse field Ising model, because it just has the simplest terms in the Hamiltonian. It's, it's barely quantum at all in some sense. And it's, it's already interesting even in 1D. So many of you know this model. It's, think about a bunch of sites that just have a spin a half on them and then they interact through this term sigma z, sigma z, that just wants them to point in the same direction. So see, if we make this other term very weak, that's what they do, they either all point up or they all point down. But then there's this other term that's kind of the spoiler, the transverse field. It doesn't commute with this term, so that's what makes the model quantum. And if that term is very large, it wants the spins all just to point in one direction, to the right, say, you know, for the sign that I wrote. So there's a phase transition where this behavior switches over, where either you have two ground states all up or all down with some quantum fluctuations on top, or you have one ground state where all the spins point to the right with some quantum fluctuations. 
And so that's, that's just to be concrete, so we have a model to think about. Um, and so what does the wave function of this model look like? Well, it's just a weighted sum of all the basis states. So we just have all the basis states in the SZ basis. That's pretty simple, okay? Um, this is just very introductory, so I think this is probably, you know, too easy for some of you, but you know what I mean when I say that. It's just a tensor product space of all these basis states, so there's two to the n of these things if we have n spins. Um, this is a, you know, I'm gonna be talking about tensor networks, so just for those of you who aren't as used to spin models, say, this could apply equally well to, say, fermions in some kind of orbital basis or Slater determinant basis. So, so when, I, when I say labels S1 through Sn, that doesn't have to mean spins. That could mean some other states. Um, so it could mean orbital states. So here, what I mean by this kind of 0, 0, 1, 0, 1 thing is actually what I mean is that I, I mean that orbital number 3 and 5 are occupied. So when you actually write this in real space, you'd get a Slater determinant. So this is some kind of second quantized form of many body um, electronic wave function. So I'll be talking kind of pretty general terms, but just to say this could apply to spins, this could apply to electrons. Um, okay, so what we want to do is we want to think about how do we tackle the wave function so that we could try to find the ground state, which is one of these things. So let's write the wave function in some more compact form. So that's, that's how it's sort of, that's the full thing written out. Um, so let's write it in a more compact form. Let's say, okay, let's label the basis states by these indices, S1 through Sn which could take two values or four values or, or different amounts of values. And then, then in that form, the amplitudes look like a big tensor. That's all I wanted to say on this slide. So the idea is that we have n spins or n electrons or something, and then these take a finite amount of discrete values. So naturally, the coefficients just look like a big tensor. They just also have n indices, okay? So that's the amplitude tensor. So in some sense, that is the wave function. So if we can work with this tensor, you know, for some given basis, then we can work with many body wave functions. So we need tools and techniques to work with tensors with lots of indices. So um, just to motivate, okay, what is a tensor network and where does it come from, let's think of this tensor in different ways. What do I mean by this tensor, right? So I don't necessarily, in this context, mean all the fancy things you can say about tensors in, talk, in terms of transformations and change of basis. Here, I'm just thinking of a tensor as some map. It's just a map that says, it's like a rule where it says, if you show me one of these spin configurations, up, down, up, 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 then I give you a number, a complex number, that goes with that configuration. So it's just named by that configuration. Okay, here's another one, I give you another complex number, and so on. So we could think of it as a big, you know, a big object full of all these numbers. We can also just think of it as this arrow. It's like a map. So any rule that assigns a complex number to one of these configurations is this tensor, okay? So we don't necessarily have to think of it as a bunch of numbers sitting on a hard drive. We can think of it as some rule we can implement. All right. Um, so it would be hopeless to try to actually store this whole thing, right? Because it's this exponential growth issue. Um, you, people have tried taking it in the teeth using symmetries and using big computers and just working really hard. But that only gets you to about 50 spins. So there's this, this new postdoc at the um, Flatiron Institute, Alex Vitek. I think he's perhaps done the largest ED calculation ever with Andreas Lachely. They used this automatic symmetry finding uh, software that they developed and got up to 50 spins. So that's the biggest you can do. Maybe five years from now you can do 51 or two. And then, so, you know, so that's, that's slow going. So this exponential cost is a very serious barrier. So we can get around it though different ways. Um, so the way that leads to matrix product states and tensor networks is to say, that we know from physics considerations, from some theory that's been done, and just kind of from, from physical intuition, that if we think about this 1D chain of spins, say, that defines the transfer field Ising model, that correlations between them get weak as you go to longer and longer distances away. So if I take, say, this correlator, think of it as like a connected correlator if, if there's an order parameter in the system. Um, then as I take i and j farther and farther and farther away, then this correlation function generically decays. And um, that's, that you can show that's always the case, and that this correlation is, decays exponentially, in fact, in 1D if the system has a gap between the ground states and the first excited state. So we can use that. Okay, so we can use that by saying, okay, instead of having to be stuck storing this whole um, wave function tensor, we can try to store approximations to it instead. So the simplest approximation you can do, this, this goes by the name mean field theory, there's different forms of it, this is one form, is to say let's neglect the correlations altogether and let's just chop the wave function up into these pieces. So it's a thing that carries um, n indices, here I'm just taking n equals six so it can fit on the slide. And so I'll say, well that's just, um, how about six different objects each that have one index, right? So I'll just say it's an outer product of a bunch of vectors. And um, this works. 
you can do this, and you can get local properties OK by putting the correct numbers into these vectors. Um, but you're missing correlations just by construction. And um, you can repair this in different ways. So something that people, like say, in quantum chemistry do is they'd say, OK, well, that's oscillator determinant, maybe, if you properly anti-symmetrize or you work in a second quantized form. So we could fix this by saying, well, that's one. Maybe more is better. So you, you add up oscillator determinants. And that, that can work really, really well for sort of moderately correlated systems. But that can still break down in a lot of ways, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry? Um, is, your, is your question, can this capture long range order? It sort of can. I mean, so you, can, you could make this represent a ferromagnetic state where all the spins are pointing in the same direction. So this could capture a kind, this could capture long range order in a sense. But you're still missing the fluctuations on top of that. So, um, so yeah, but that's a good question, though. So this, this captures a lot. So that's why I put this green check to say this, this gets you pretty far. But this is just mean field theory and some form of mean field theory. So there's different ways of fixing this. One is to sum these, more of these states up. But there's a different way. So a different way is to actually put in fake indices. So to say, OK, the problem with this, you can view it as a math issue. You can say, that's a tensor with six indices. This is six tensors with one index. Those just aren't the same thing, right? So we could start promoting these back from being tensors with one index to being tensors with more indices. And then you know, we can maybe work our way back over to this full thing over here. So how does that work? So what you can do is you can put fake indices on these objects and then sum them back out. So you can promote this first one from being a vector with one index to a matrix with two indices, S1 and also this fake one, I1. And you can also stick this I1 index on this object, but then sum it back out. So that line is indicating a sum. It's like, let's sum over I1. So we still have something on the right that has all these indices S1 through S6, but there's more going on inside it now with this I1 index. And we can also put an index I2 on that one and have that match up with this index I2 on this one and sum back out over I2, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. And the resulting structure is this thing called a matrix product state. And notice that's not the only way we could have done this game. We didn't have to put I1, I1, I2, I2 like that. We could have put I1 here and then put the other copy of I1 way over here or something like that. And we could have had this kind of spaghetti web of I1 connecting somewhere far away, I2 connecting somewhere far away. But instead, we did it in this chain-like form. So that might make you suspect that this is best for 1D systems, and that is the case. But it actually works pretty well for even for like 2D systems and other kinds of things that don't necessarily have a 1D structure. Um, so we'll unpack a bit this form and why is it called a matrix product state. But let me just say that this works extremely well, especially for these 1D systems. So you can get local properties extremely accurately, and you can prove or, or show that it actually has exponentially de decaying correlations generically. So I mentioned there's this theoretical understanding that that's what 1D systems have. Well, this has it. So in some sense, this is like the right form of, 1D, of kind of all 1D wave functions with a gap. You can argue that this, this is sort of the correct form of 1D wave functions. OK, any questions about that? I'll, I'll say some of this a few different ways. Mm -hmm. You definitely could. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so that, that leads to these other ideas like PEPS tensor networks, these 2D tensor networks, for example. And there's other ideas, too, that are sort of in the realm of tensor networks. There are these things called correlator product states. They're also called like entangled plaque states, um, neural quantum states. So there are these other ideas that are sort of a little bit past what I would call a tensor network, but they involve uh, um, kind of taking or string bond states is another version of this where maybe you could have not only one of these tensors, but you could say the wave function is defined as a product of multiple tensors that are all decomposed in a way like this, but with different patterns of the string. So one that goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, but another one that goes 1, 3, 5, 2, 4, 6, or something like that, and then layer those together. And you, could get, you can get a certain distance with that, although you can start to lose some of the benefits of this more simple approach. So sometimes it comes with trade-offs, yeah. OK, great, yeah. Uh, what kind of what is, sorry? Mm. Mm. That's a good question. So, so, so I think you could probably see how S1 and 2, it's, it's worth unpacking this a little bit. So I think if we start there, you can see that if, if we just ignore for a minute S3 through S6, um, then 
what I've done here is say, okay, this part, S, just the S1, S2 part, actually, how about I just write this on the board? Um, so let's say the wave function only had two spins, psi, S1, S2, then I could approximate that by this, um, maybe I should call these by a different name, or I'll call this capital psi, okay. And then I could do this product form, and we know that's just an approximation. Um, but now if I introduce this I1 index, and sum over it, then if I1 goes from, uh, if it goes over two values, then all I'm doing is writing a, um, two, a two by two matrix as the product of two other two by two matrices. So that's just to say that could represent, this can represent any two by two matrix, because we know any two by two matrix can always be written as a product of two other two by two matrices. So that's fine. Um, but where that starts to not work as well is when you introduce more indices. Um, Now it's kind of like saying, if this only runs over two values, I'm, rep I'm representing some two by two by two thing as a product of just two by two matrices in a sense, like if I kind of cover up that index or cover up that index. So it starts to break down. Um, but then you can still, it turns out you can always represent any tensor in this form as long as these I indices run over enough values. Like maybe I have to bump I up to go over three values or something at some point, or four values as I keep adding more S indices. Um, now, I think to more directly answer your question, you were asking about correlations to say between S1 and S3. So part of the reason I said what I just said is to say, it's very, you can very quickly get arbitrary correlations between S1 and S2, and then S2 and S3. But you can also start to get correlations between S1 and S3 or S1 and S4. You can think of them as being kind of carried, almost like passengers like on a subway. You can kind of think like, I set the spin S1 to a certain value and that puts a certain matrix here. And then that matrix comes over here and it kind of does something to S2. It like drops off some passengers at the S2 station, but not all the passengers. Some of them get off at that station, but some of them stay on the train and go further to S3 and then get off there. So information can keep going arbitrarily far away. But it's just that you can imagine by, by the time I've passed more and more and more and more stations, the passengers that get off here mostly have all gotten off. You know? So when I get to station 80, you know, all the passengers that got on at station one have mostly all gotten off by now. So that's the correlations decaying. You know, the influence of spite one is felt less and less and less and less as you go further along. So. Mm. Um, for gapless states? Gapped. Mm. Mm -hmm. For gapped states, it works very well. For gapless states, it also works very well, just not as well. So it's interesting, because you'll read some papers that will say it doesn't work for gapless states, but then if you look at it, these are um, people who are trying to sell you other wave functions. So these are very good people, you know. But they're, usually the paper is something about a different kind of uh, tensor network. So it'll be a paper about Mira or something, and they'll say, They'll say, use Mira because MPS doesn't work for gapless states. But always be, you know, always be suspicious when someone's trying to sell you a product, right? So Mira is great, and you should use Mira. It's interesting. But that doesn't mean MPS is bad. So it turns out matrix product states work extremely well for gapless systems, at least in 1D, you know, and, and also somewhat in 2D, too. Um, they just work less well. So you have to work harder. Um, basically, they can represent power law correlations very accurately out to thousands of sites. But this just eventually, they must cross over to exponential decay eventually. So then out to 2,000 or 5,000 sites or something, it, it'll be exponential. But um, as long as you work hard enough on a finite size system or, or an infinite system, but you measure only out to certain distances, you know, it can work very well. And, and it gets very good energies because you know, the energy might only be, the, the, the Hamiltonian may only have a local support of two sites. So if you can get power law decays out to thousands of sites, the energy is good. So um, yes, it's a good question. Okay. Yeah. Mostly ground state, yeah. There's been some work recently on finite temperature and uh, it works pretty well for finite temperature. Real time is coming along a bit, but it's not very far along. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you know, also you have to remember what's the bar to compare to, right? So, so it works okay for 2D for finite temperature. But um, it doesn't have a sign problem, these methods in 2D. So it's like, it, it doesn't work that great, but it's the only thing that can actually treat certain problems. Maybe, or maybe it and one other method or something is the only, so 2D is tough for a lot of things. And uh, 
Also, time evolution, you know, it, it has problems with time evolution, but, but it's one of the few methods that can actually do it at all. So, so the, the bar is just very high in physics for success, and, and you know, it's interesting to try all these things. Mm -hmm. Um, right, so, and most of the problems I'm talking about, you can't solve the problem. These are numerical, I mean, as you know, you know, so these are numerical approaches. So, if it's, if it's time, in, if it's time dependent or independent Hamiltonian, you can do a lot numerically, but you're right, you can't really solve it, but you can, you can learn a lot by numerically simulating it with these techniques, for sure. Yeah. Um, okay, so a little bit more motivation. So, um, I'll kind of fly through this part. This, this is just to give, you know, everybody's brain works a little differently, so I want to motivate matrix product states from some different perspectives. So thanks for those good questions. Um, so, so I mentioned this other perspective where we said, okay, it's kind of like a map, right? So you can think of it as a machine that eats spin configurations and then spits out complex numbers, right? So we, we can just make this map in some way, any way that, that occurs to us. We can make up any rule. So how about this rule, and it seems kind of crazy at first, but it leads right back to the same idea of matrix product states. So the rule is, is take a spin and associate a matrix to it. So it's like replacing spins with matrices. I mean, it's kind of weird at first, but let's just go with it, you know. Then, once we have these matrices, what do we do with them? Multiply them together and get a probability. Now, I mean, a product of matrices is not a number, it's another matrix, but we'll, we'll see how to fix that. Um, so pictorially, what this means is take an up spin and replace that by an up matrix take a down spin and replace that by a down matrix. And these matrices can be totally different from each other. They can be arbitrary matrices, they can be singular, or not singular, whatever matrices you want. Only constraint is that they need to have the same size for the same spin. Um, and uh, then use them by saying, okay, if I wanna assign an amplitude to the pattern up, down, up, up, down, go up, down, up, up, down, like that. So just replace the spins with these matrices. And here I'm putting subscripts to say, the two matrices on site one could be different from the two matrices on site two and site three and so on, or they could be the same. Um, and the reason you get a number is that you can, it's easy to arrange for the first matrix, or the first pair of matrices, the ones for up and down on site one, to have a row size of one, and the last one to have a, a column size of one. So that when you're done, you get a one by one matrix at the end, i.e. a number. But all the ones in the middle could be, you know, five by three or whatever sizes you want. Like the only constraint is that on a given site, the, the two matrices have to be the same size. So then from this rule, it's pretty obvious why this thing is called a matrix product state, and we'll see how it connects back to the other one. So just to show you how the rule works some more, if I have that pattern, up, up, down, 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 I use this pattern of matrices or this pattern. So the idea is that I just replace spins with matrices and multiply them together, and that gives me amplitudes. So it's just some rule to get amplitudes from spin patterns. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, um, well it could, be, it could be exactly equal sometimes, but most of the time, most contexts where you use this, it's approximate. And it's approximate because you typically limit the size of the matrices, yeah. So if you made the matrices big enough, you can easily show that you can represent any wave function. But that generally has to be exponentially big matrices. So you don't usually wanna do that. You don't gain anything if you do that usually, so. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, well, the nice thing is we have some algorithms that do that for you, so that's really neat. So the DMRG algorithm is, is a famous algorithm for lots of reasons, but one reason is it's adaptive. So you start with an arbitrary size of matrices, say all one by one, and then you run the algorithm and they, they can grow and shrink adaptively. But you could also just choose it, do a problem where you choose it a certain size, see how you do, then start over and choose a bigger size and see if you do better. And that can, be, that can work really well too. Yeah, it's a good question. So. Um, it can be a problem for other tensor networks how to do that. Like, we have ideas, but it can be tougher for the other ones. This one, we know how to do it very well. So this is another way of writing that same thing, a matrix product state. Here, I've kind of suppressed those I1, I2, I3 indices that I had in the other motivation, but it's the same thing. It's like, those I, those I indices are the indices of the matrices, and the S tells you which matrix to pick on a given site. Um, so now some basic facts about it. I already touched on those in some of the questions, but let me just say that let's say the typical size of the matrices is M by M. I mean, as I mentioned, on a finite size system, the first one might have to be one by M or something. But let's say typically the ones in the middle are M by M. Then if you do some counting, you can see that this takes the full wave function, which has to have two to the N parameters, to just two times N, because there's two matrices on each site for N sites, times M squared parameters, because every matrix has M squared entries in it. Um, so that's a massive compression. You've taken the n from the exponent down to in front. And you can actually get the n out of there entirely if you assume translation invariance. So this is a you know, huge compression from some kind of exponentially growing approach to some nice kind of polynomially growing approach. 
And um, you can show that if this m is large enough, you can represent any tensor whatsoever. It's just that it has to be exponentially big, though. It basically has to be 2 to the n over 2, and you can represent anything. But that's not, you don't want to have to go that big. So you try to get away with a smaller m. OK, so for the rest of the talk, and today, tomorrow, it'll be really helpful to use this, this notation called tensor diagram notation. So I want to introduce that right now. And it makes it a lot easier to motivate everything else I'm going to say. Um, so this, this notation works as follows. So I've been writing tensors in this kind of classical notation with, where they're just multi-index you know, arrays of numbers in the way I'm thinking about them. Um, but it's nice to write them graphically. And don't be intimidated by the graphical notation if you haven't seen it before. It's, it's actually pretty simple. So all it is is that you have this blob, which is the tensor, and then the indices are these lines sticking out of the tensor. And there's less rules about it than you might think. Like basically the indices can stick out of any direction and and that's kind of it. I mean, people impose conventions on it in different contexts. They might have rules about which way the indices point and things, but generally there's not that many rules. So there's only really basically two rules. One is that for um, every index you have a line sticking out and you can put labels on them if it helps, but later you can start leaving the labels off. And um, this just shows you how that looks for different basic tensors. So simplest example of a tensor besides a scalar is a vector with one index. So that's just a blob with one index. Matrix, two indices, so there's a matrix. Uh, three index tensor, so it has three indices, okay? Um, then that's rule number one. Rule number two is that um, how do you notate sums? So basically this whole notation is just a way to notate complicated sums. So rule number two is um, joining lines means that you sum over the index where you join the lines. So if you have this, in, this tensor which has two indices, i and j, and this tensor which has one index, j, and I join the line j, of the two tensors, that means I'm summing over J. So that means the thing on the right. And so we can see that that's a matrix vector product. And you can already see some benefits of the notation. So one benefit is that, is that you know, even if I didn't know what this was, um, I can see that the result has one index sticking out. So I know that the result is a vector. So I just showed you that the result of a matrix vector product is a vector. Um, and uh, you can also kind of see where this notation comes from, this idea of joining this line. It comes from some, sometimes to help yourself with complicated sums, you might put a little line underneath to kind of help you guide your eye from one index to the next. You can kind of think of that line becomes this line if you want. Um, but this notation keeps you from having to hunt through a bunch of letters and kind of find all the matching letters, and it can be very tedious. And having to have indices with subscripts and blah, 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 blah. You know. um, so you can start omitting the names, which is really, really useful. So you can say, here's a thing with two indices, and it's connected by one line to another thing with two indices. So I don't have to come up with names for those lines necessarily. But if I did, I could write it this way. And that's a product of two matrices. And again, I can see that the result has two indices. So it's a matrix. And then one other example is if I have this thing, I don't know what this is, but it definitely results in a scalar because there's no indices sticking out. They're all joined up. But that's actually the trace of a product of two matrices. And you can kind of even see graphically the idea of how you can permute within the trace. You could take the blue thing and slide it around the ring around the back and bring it into the front again. So it's kind of nice to see things like the permutation symmetry of the trace graphically. OK. Um, any questions about that notation? Yes? Hmm. Um, that's a good question. So, so generally, I'm not assuming anything like symmetric tensors or anything. You, you could um, put that in, uh, and that can be useful to do. And so sometimes you do have to be careful about naming the indices, or um, you know, like because you may notice if you're if you're rigorous minded, this is a bit of an ambiguous diagram here, right? Because which you know is that the first or second index of that? matrix. Often you know from context or you have some kind of convention about maybe things go left to right or you kind of just know from the context. But if you don't know, you can always put the letters back. That's, that's a nice thing. Mm -hmm. Sure. The matrix product state? You can, yeah. I think that's a good way to think about it. You can think of it as somehow maybe throwing out some of the correlation, or sort of damaging some of the correlations at very long distances, and, and concentrating all your effort to preserving the correlations at shorter distances, you know. Um, you can, I think you can formalize that quite a lot, yes. Um, so you can study in detail what is the structure of correlation functions in matrix product states. You can, you can identify this thing called the transfer matrix of a matrix product state. So you can, um, I wonder if this blue shows up, it kind of shows up. So if I take a matrix product state, which, um, let me go ahead and show the next slide, which might help a little bit, which has that diagrammatic notation. Um, 
And let's say it's translation invariant. This is just a comment for those of you who understand it. If not, this, don't worry about this comment too much. But I can grab one of the tensors out of it, and I can form this thing where I sum over the side index. And I can think of this as a matrix from this space to this space, like this pair to that pair. And you can actually study that matrix. It's, it's usually very expensive to diagonalize it, but you can grab the first few eigenvalues. And the, second, the ratio of the second eigenvalue to the first gives you an upper bound on all correlation function uh, 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 correlation lengths. So you can actually get a rigorous upper bound on the correlation length of an MPS weight by getting this object. So you can, you can study that in a lot more detail. And there's some nice papers. I think there's one by Zahner and Frank Fristrade's group. And they um, studied the whole kind of spectrum of this thing and found that it actually had a lot of information. If this was a ground state, you could actually find lots of information about the excited state structure just from the ground state by studying this object. So it's a really interesting thing to do, actually. So, yeah. Uh, the inverse and identity? Uh, inverse, I don't think so. Unless it's a unitary matrix, there are some things you can do. But you can invent your own symbols. So some people do. There's papers where people will sort of create new symbols. You can, yeah, you can get very, so there's a lot of extensions to the notation that are non, maybe not standard, but you can do them. And, but identity for sure, so there's a, that's a good question. So the, the identity is that there's, you just put a line. So let's say I have a tensor with four indices, and I want to multiply this one by the identity. You could have a dot and say that's the identity. But what you usually do is you just leave the dot off, and you say it's just a line. And the reason is that if I sum with the identity, you know, it doesn't do anything. It just makes a longer line, and I can just shorten the line back. So it's, that's, that's the notation. So then if you want to write, like, say, a product of identity matrices, you do that or something. And that would be, a, that would be the identity operator on four spins or something like that. So it's, it's a nice notation. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, contravariant and covariant. So I didn't mention that, but you can. So the standard thing to do there is you use arrows. So you, you do something like this. So, so in the convention, I use out, out arrows or contravariant, and in arrows or covariant. Um, some people flip that around the other way, but arrows is usually the way to do it. Yeah, and then when, with arrows, you really, it should be thought of as out and in, kind of how contravariant and covariant are sort of uh, geometric kind of ideas. So, OK, yes. How do you choose the matrices? Yeah, I'll say some more about that. Um, it depends on the context. So what you could do is, let's say you could, you can create them by hand, and I'll give examples. Um, and then that could be a starting point to then do time evolution by applying unitary operators to this thing in this form. But you can also search for them numerically. So you can use an algorithm like DMRG, and that will find optimal M matrices for you. Um, I'll, I'll tell you how that works. A bit. It depends on the context. So there's basically, I'd say, two uses of tensor networks. One, I would say, is like kind of calculational methods, and one is like variational methods, maybe, or optimization methods. So calculational methods is where you write down the answer to the problem you want in some form that's difficult, like a path integral. Then you say, my job is to compute this thing. So then you use tensor network methods to sort of work on it. But you start from the right answer, and then you end with an like approximation to the right answer. But the other methods are more variational or, you know, uh, optimizational or whatever, I don't know. And uh, those you, you just start with, even it could be random numbers for these, and then you, you try to say to apply gradients or small eigenvalue problems onto little pieces of it and improve them a bit at a time. Yeah, so I'll say more about that in some detail. Um, so just to say, why do we use this diagram magnetic notation? I think it should be fairly clear, but, but it's just that if we really write out, this slide kind of unifies the notation from the two other slides about a matrix product state. Here's the matrix product form of a matrix product state. Here's the one that shows the I indices, but on this slide I've written them as alpha indices, which is a bit more standard. Um, so when you write it out all the way as this chain of contracted three index tensors, it looks really bad. Like I've seen that notation in a lot of papers and it's just, it's just terrible, right? I mean, it's clear, but it's, it's very complicated. So we like this diagrammatic notation better because you can leave off the names. So you can leave off the alphas, you can even leave off the S's. And that's just a lot cleaner once you get used to it than looking at expressions like that in papers. And it starts to help you have an intuition for these things and be a little bit more creative about extensions you could be, maybe do with them. So um, what are some of those extensions on that note? So um, the two most well-known extensions of this matrix product state idea are these two, the PEPS tensor network, which is, the name is not so useful. It stands for projected entangled pair states, but you could just, maybe a better name would be tensor grids or something like that. And uh, all it is is just the idea of extending MPS to 2D. I'll say a bit more about that. And the MIRA, which is extending matrix product states by making them layered. 
So kind of how there's like regular neural networks and deep neural networks, these are kind of like deep MPS or something if you want. I mean, that's just a motivation. I don't know if that's really true. Um, and this has been introduced and motivated in these, in these works. So I, I can send my slides around if people want them later to have these references. Um, so what is the PEPS tensor network? So you can think about tackling a 2D problem by saying, okay, if matrix product state works well for 1D, which it does, and I'll, I'll have some slides explaining some of the applications a bit later, um, then maybe we can try that in 2D by putting them along the columns of a 2D system. But then you say, oh wait, what about the rows of the system? So we left those out. They're not gonna be correlated beyond mean field. So you might flip it the other way and that's not gonna work. So you do something very simple and you say, well what if we just connect it up in the pattern of the actual 2D lattice? And you say, okay, success. And so there was a lot of enthusiasm when that idea was first proposed, but then it was realized this isn't quite as easy because now you have loops. And it makes so many of the sums you want to do, even just normalizing the, one of these things is like some exponentially sharp p-hard algorithm to do it direct, exactly. But you can do really nice controlled approximations that help you do all the things you need to do of optimization and things like that. Um, so, so someone who's made extensive use of these and has, has really you know, developed a lot of these approximations is Philippe Corbos. So I encourage you to look at, at all his papers on PEPs. Um, just to give you a, this is just to give you a flavor. I'm not gonna have a lot more to say about them, but we could, we could discuss them in the afternoon if you want. Um, so you can actually address infinite 2D systems with PEPs. That's one of the strengths of them, by taking all the tensors to be the same, or maybe the same within a small unit cell. And um, you can do these interesting updates where basically you, you double the network onto itself, summing over most or all of the site indices. Then you think of these corners as these kind of semi-infinite contracted tensor networks, and you use these techniques, these, these things called like TRG or corner transfer matrix. Basically, they're kind of like matrix product states at the boundary that you bring in. Um, to reduce all of that to one big tensor with those fat indices you can think of as something like the product of all of those, but compressed down. Um, you can do that for the corners and the sides and you can get an environment. I mean, you really do all these steps. And then um, update that one tensor here in the middle by you know, attaching it to this environment, computing one update, and then redoing this over and over and over again, basically. So you can actually get really state-of-the-art results for challenging 2D systems this way. Um, so that's just a, one slide on PEPs. Um, Mira is a different thing. It's, it's a generalization of a um, matrix product state to have a layered structure. And so why might you want to do that? What's the reason? Well, the reason is that you can show rigorously that at least at long distances, a matrix product state only captures exponentially decaying correlations. So if I measure two operators at some distance x and then take that further and further apart, you know, decays exponentially. Um, but a Mira, you can show at least, you can construct Mira that exactly have parallel correlations to all distances. And how does that work? It's interesting. So there's, you know, if I put the two operators near each other, they have some correlation with each other. But then, as you bring them further and further apart, the correlation um, function is dominated by these contributions that take the shortest path up into the network and through like that. So it's kind of like these geodesic paths through the network. And so the idea is that these geodesic paths only grow, the length of them only grows very slowly as you drag these two points apart because it can kind of go up and through the network and shortcut. So by contrast, what if it had to bump through the bottom? It would have to go, through this one, then through that one, da 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 da, -da. You basically get like a, like a contribution from every tensor in the bottom. It'd be like a product of however many you went through. So that's why it goes exponentially in the matrix product state. But here, you can basically hit fewer tensors by going up and over this way. So it's a really nice idea. Um, so that's sort of the key aspect, the key point of Amira. Um, so just to give you a bit more perspective, I would say that right now the status of things is that these are starting to be operationalized quite a lot for like really tough 2D physics problems. Mira is sort of more in the space of like, where it's really nice ideas, um, maybe connecting to high energy physics even, but it's not quite as kind of weaponized for sort of attacking challenging problems as PEPs and MPS are. Mm -hmm. Sorry? Oh, what do the triangles mean? So I didn't, yeah, I didn't get into that. Just for the sake of time, I'm a bit limited, but basically the triangles are just, on some level, all they are is tensors that have three indices, but they have, they're constrained to, and versus the, these have four. But the, um, if you think about it as a quantum circuit or as some kind of unitary network, they're all unitaries. So the ones with four, they just mix two sites together. So they change bases of two sites. The ones with three take two of the sites, one from one side, one from the other, and, and, com and compress or reduce them. It's like a change of basis and a projection. So it's saying take, say, this four-dimensional space and represent it by a two-dimensional space. So it's, it's not a unitary. It's like a, first a unitary, then a projection. You know? So it's like an RG step, like a renormalization group step. You merge. You know. Yes? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you could. So you could try this in momentum space. Um, that, unfortunately, has not worked out too well. And that gets to the issue that I don't have a lot of slides. We could talk about it more, about the idea of the area law of entanglement. Um, and it turns out in momentum space, generically, it doesn't hold, except exactly at non-interacting points. And it doesn't even hold that well even near. Not, once you even introduce a tiny amount of interactions, you're hit with the volume law of entanglement, like the maximum amount of entanglement scaling right away pretty fast. So unfortunately, that hasn't been that much of a success to apply tensor networks to momentum space grids. But fortunately, the real space approach is working quite well. Um, and now applying it to things other than, even than, than lattice models in physics, that's what I'll be talking about a good bit tomorrow. So applying it to lattices, but the lattices might be pixels of images or something like that, not even not even physics lattice models necessarily. And there, the momentum space approach has actually worked a good bit better. So, so it turns out, you know, images have different correlations than sort of wave functions do in some sense, which isn't too surprising, but it's, it's interesting to think about the differences. So, yeah, we could talk a bit more about this. So, so unfortunately, I can't cover, you know, everything about tensor networks, because I, I literally taught like a, you know, 18 hour, one week course earlier this year about it. So there's a lot could be said in going in these different directions, but, um, but uh, mostly today about matrix product states. So, um, okay, so let me, uh, and we can kind of loop back to some of this, but let me in the remaining 10 minutes just go through a couple of concrete examples, and this kind of gets to a question over there about how do we know what to put into these matrices, right? So let me just tell you about two examples of you know, exact matrix product states that we can write down, um, and then we'll talk a bit more later today about ways you can find them numerically as well. So, okay, so two examples that are meant to be just kind of instructive. Um, so one is a singlet. Okay, just real simple. Like simplest thing we could think of as a non-trivial wave function. So we could start with a product state, but that one's too easy. So let's do a singlet. So let's think of two spin a halves, and want, we want to represent this wave function, right? So this, in a way, could be maybe one of the tougher wave functions to represent because it's maximally entangled. Um, so we can write it suggestively like this. We can say, let's factorize it by some kind of vector of the states for the first spin and a vector of the states for the second spin and then write it as a product, like a dot product of these two vectors. And I think you can see how this would give the same state above. So we would have one over root two up times down, and but the times here is like a funny times. It's like a vector sum, but it's like a ket outer product, right? So the times of the kets is just putting them next to each other, but there's a sum running here internally, which is summing over the two states in each vector. Okay, so it's kind of a funny thing. Um, and then the other combination is one over root two down times minus up, and that would be this other term. Okay, so it's some kind of ket-valued vectors that I'm dot projecting together, if you'll allow me to do that. But you can make that mathematically rigorous. So why is that a matrix product state? Maybe it's already fairly obvious to you why it is. I mean, you can think of these as, um, as you, this is basically already a valid form of a matrix product state. In fact, the oldest papers on matrix product states started by thinking them in this form. Um, so this is just a one by two matrix, and this is a two by one matrix if you want. And um, then, the, then the index, the kind of S index that sticks out of the matrices is just telling you what combination of up and down you're in for each entry of the matrix. Here you're totally in up, here you're totally in down. But let's, let's try to unpack this a bit more. I mean, this may be more confusing than helpful on this slide. But if you want to try to explode this out and think about these as really these tensors, then you can kind of think about it like this. You can say, if I fix this, now the spin index is the one kind of coming out of the plane, like out of the board. If I clamp the spin index to be up, then that vector turns into this vector, one over root two zero. So that's one of the matrices. That's like the M1 up matrix, if you want, is one over root two zero. But if I clamp the first spin to be down, it's zero, one over root two. So that's the, that's the M down one matrix. And then on this other uh, spin, if I clamp it to be up, it's zero minus one. If I clamp it to be down, it's one zero. So, so that's like saying, again, um, if I write it in this form of psi S1, S2 equals M1, S1, M2, S2, it's like saying M1 up equals one over root two, zero. M1 down equals zero, one over root two, and so on. And it's kind of similar for M2, just the other half of the slide. Okay, questions about that? Okay, so it looks complicated now. You're, it's like taking a really simple wave function and making it look terrible, right? So that looks really simple, 
you know. Um, and that looks really complicated. But computers like this better. They don't know what a ket is. You have to tell them what a ket is, right? So they know what boxes of numbers are. They can store arrays. So that's, that's the advantage. And also, the real payoff is that you can compress really big wave functions down. Here, there was no compression, but you can, you can compress them when they get really big. So we'll see that on the next slide. OK, so how do you compress a much bigger wave function as a matrix product state? So let's take a very important example of a wave function, which is just a single particle state. OK, um, here it could, you can think of it as a fermion if you want, but it's just one particle, so it could be a hardcore boson or something else. Um, so this is just a state where we have amplitude phi 1 to be on the first site or in the first orbital, whichever way you want to think about it, um, or amplitude phi 2 to be in the second site or orbital, phi 3, phi 4, and so on. So it's just totally generic one particle state with amplitudes phi j to be on site j. Okay, and that's what I've written here in this kind of second quantized form. So how do we write that as a matrix product state? Um, let me just show you, and then we'll kind of see why this construction works. So what we do is we say, okay, using this kind of ket-valued matrix notation, which is the most compact one that I know for writing it on slides, let's, um, put the let's make the first matrix be phi 1 of 1 or just uh, 1 times 0. So basically, that's going to say that if we reach into that matrix and pull out the 1 state, that's going to carry this amplitude phi 1 with it. Or we could reach into that matrix and pull out the 0 state, and we won't have any amplitude yet. The amplitude will come later. Let me write the other ones, and then we'll kind of see why this works. So the second one looks like this. It's just 0 state on the diagonal, uh, phi 2, 1 here on this off diagonal, and that one is just the number 0. So that's neither the ket 1 or the ket 0. That's just the 0 of the vector space. Okay. That's not a vacuum state. And then after that, the pattern just repeats. So you just have the same pattern over and over again, but now on site 3 with phi 3, on site 4 with phi 4, and so on. So some kind of like transfer matrix construction, if you want, for, but for things that are not the Ising model, like other things. Okay. And then that continues all the way up into the next to last site. Then on the very last site, you have this capping off uh, vector. And if you look at this, actually, that's just the second row, the bottom row of that matrix. And this is just the first column of that same matrix, just with the correct site number. So it's really the same pattern throughout. It's just that you have to have some starting and ending conditions. So you start by saying, I'll start in the first row and I'll end on the first column. That's just some way to kind of make sure that you get the right uh, result. OK, so how does this work? So one way to look at this is to tell a story and say, OK, I start in the first row. And here, I could either pick phi 1, 1. And that means I leave in state 1, meaning like this, the vector index is set now to state 1, because I picked that entry. So that means I'm going to go into this matrix in the first row. And in the first row, I only have one option, which is zero, this, this vacuum. If I pick that, I get 0, and the wave function dies. So I can't pick that. I have to pick that. So I pick vacuum. But now I'm still leaving in the first column, which means I come here in the first row. So I have to pick that. 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 So I just get vacuum the rest of the time if I pick this. If I pick this, something else happens. I leave on the second column. I go to the second row. And now I still haven't you know, picked one of these yet. So I can pick that or that. So maybe I pick vacuum, vacuum, vacuum. Then I pick phi 4. Well, let's say I pick phi 3 here. So I go vacuum, vacuum. I pick this. Now I've picked phi 3 one. So now I've gotten that. And then now I'm back into leaving on the first column, and I just get zeros the rest of the time. So I, just, I get these particles going in at certain places only once. But, or I can just study this by multiplying the matrices out. So I can say, let me multiply this vector by this matrix. And when I do, I get that. So I get this combination. OK, so that first term is coming from, uh, that first term is just coming from, basically, that 0 goes over and meets this phi 1, 1. And then, uh, let's see, then that meets this empty state. And that just products with that 0. So I get that, OK? Then this is going to come over and do something interesting. This column is going to come over and kind of mix with these two. It's either going to expand these to have vacuum state on site 3, or it's going to expand this to have a particle on site 3. This one is just going to bump this vacuum along and make it a vacuum of three sites now. So that's what happens. OK? Same kind of thing. This, this column here, again, is going to either expand these by having vacuum on site 4, or it's going to expand this one by having particle on site 4. This one's, again, just going to bump the vacuum up, and so on. And so when we're done, we, um, we get that state above, if we kept, we kept repeating this. So anyway, that was kind of a belabored explanation of how you write that as a matrix product state. But I think it's interesting that you can take this state that formerly lives in um, 
this kind of you know, two to the n dimensional space and write it as a product of two, uh, just two by two matrices. So that's a massive compression of that state. Not so impressive because it's a single particle state, but you can actually do that for many particle states as well. Um, if you do this construction, it doesn't scale, but there's a really nice paper by Fishman and White that shows you how to scale this kind of construction to like arbitrary amounts of particles if they're not interacting. Okay, um, it's interesting just to note that there's lots of non-trivial wave functions that have exact representations as MPS, not just that single particle state, but all of these other examples as well. The AKLT ground state, if you know what that is, the Majum Dargosh ground state, that's just a product of singlets. Um, the GHZ states, W states, these are of interest, these are of interest to um, you know, people thinking about quantum information and things like that. Um, cluster states, which are related, these are actually an example of an SPT state, but they're used in this thing called cluster-based quantum computation. And then um, the Kataev toy chain ground states. So these are the states of this model written by Kataev that actually have Majorana edge states. So if you ever find yourself confused about what do people mean by edge states or Majorana edge states, read this paper that I can send you the link by Kataev. And um, it's an exact solution to a model that you can write down and solve yourself and understand all the details. And it has a matrix product state representation, which is neat to see as well. Um, so a lot of these are mentioned in this paper by Perez Garcia. Okay, that's the last slide of the morning, um, right on time. Okay, great, so uh, a few minutes for questions if you have them. Yes. Hmm. Um, let's see, so, um, so if you mean constructing them, like finding them numerically, then it's the, it's the dimension of the linear dimension of the matrix cubed. So it's not so bad. And that's, that's a really good scaling. Um, otherwise, it can depend a lot. If you mean constructing them in time by like a time dependent process, like applying some kind of unitary evolution to find them, that can be a problem. Like it can grow, that can lead you into deep into the exponential part of the um, Hilbert space from the point of view of these. So it can be a lot worse. So it just depends then on what state you're heading toward. Okay, so we'll have time for questions in the later lecture. I think I might be the next one too. So anyway, thanks for your attention.